Welcome to our first town hall that we have hosted. We are so excited today that each of you are here. My name is Karen Alston and I work, I have a dual role today. I'm here representing Eagle Academy Public Charter School and the Cassandra S. Pinckney Foundation. And for those of you that are not familiar with the Cassandra S. Pinckney Foundation, we created this foundation to do events just like this today because when Eagle Academy was founded by Dr. Smith and Mrs. Pinckney, they wanted the school to be a community school that represented the values and the mission of Eagle Academy. And the Cassandra S. Pinckney Foundation was created to assist all of those goals and hopes for our students, our community, and our city. So I also have to take a moment to thank my dear friend in crime who's in the back, Tamika Bowden, from DC Public Charter School Board. So back in January, we on a very, very cold day, we were sitting, uh, having some tea, talking about this topic that we are here for today, which is a very important topic, which is the need for more men of color in K through 12 education. And as we were sitting there having a conversation, we both said to each other, we need to do something about this. And that is how the idea for today's town hall came to be. So this is a proud moment for both of us because we watched an idea come to fruition and we are so happy that each of you are here. So I'm gonna take a moment to thank Tamika and DC Public Charter School Board for their support of today. And I'm going to introduce all of our panelists and turn this conversation over to our moderator. And as I mentioned, we are going to live stream today's event on our Facebook page, so you'll be able to share it on your personal pages. And please, please uh, use the hashtag town hall, the 7%. Thank you. So I am so excited about today's panel. They are each remarkable men and I decided to add a little gender balance by being the person who would introduce them today. But this is such an important conversation. We wanted men to lead this conversation and talk about the impact that men of color have in our educational system. So I'm gonna start off by asking a quick question. By a show of hands, how many people believe it is important to have men in the classroom? Thank you. So I wanna to introduce today's panel. I'm just going to do a brief overview of their bio and then introduce our moderator for today, Marvin Bowser, who's going to take over from here. So Cameron Lewis is currently in his second year as a recruiter with Urban Teachers, a national nonprofit whose mission is attracting and retaining effective teachers in high poverty schools. Prior to this role, he enjoyed careers as a staff member of the U.S. House of Representatives and as an elementary school teacher in Washington, D.C. During his time as a teacher, Mr. Lewis received numerous awards and recognition for improving student achievement throughout his school network and across the region as determined by the Achievement Network. Additionally, Cameron served in various school leadership capacities where he mentored and developed early career educators. Cameron received a Master's in Education in Educational Policy and Leadership from American University and a BA in African American Studies and Political Science from Howard University. Cameron, please come up and join us on stage. Mm -hmm. Next, we have Dr. Marco Clark. Dr. Clark is a well-respected educator, innovator, author, public speaker, and veteran in the world of urban education. Dr. Clark currently serves as the founder and CEO of the Richard Wright Public Charter School for Journalism and Media Arts in Washington, D.C. In addition to his work as founder and CEO, he is chairman of Man the Block, an organization focused on providing safe passage for students to and from school. Dr. Clark strongly believes that illiteracy is the civil rights issue of today and the catastrophe of tomorrow if it is left uncorrected. Dr. Clark has been featured in Jet, Jet Magazine, The Huffington Post, and the New York Times discussing his battles with reading as a youth and his educational reform efforts to fight against world illiteracy and community issues throughout the country. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Marco Clark. Mm -hmm. 
Royston Maxwell Little joined Eagle Academy in 2006. He has a wealth of experience from Eagle Academy and has worked in various positions, including special education, summer school principal, and vice principal. Mr. Little currently serves as principal for grades one to three of the Eagle Academy Public Charter School at Congress Heights. He strongly believes that all students should be, prepared, should be provided a high quality education and that all students can reach their full academic potential regardless of their social or economic background. Mr. Little has a MS in educational leadership from Walden University, a BS in physical education from Virginia State, and a teaching certificate from Virginia Commonwealth University. Forgive me. Max, please join us on stage. Rick Cruz is the chair of the Public Charter School Board. Mr. Cruz has long been involved in public education. In Washington, D.C., he served as the chief executive officer of D.C. Prep Public Charter School, which focuses on student academic achievement, character education, and high school and college readiness. On a national level, Mr. Cruz held senior level positions at the Network for Teaching Entrepreneurship. Teach for America and America's Promise Alliance. He is currently Executive Director of Strategic Partnerships at the College Board, a nonprofit organization which connects students to college success. Outside of education, Mr. Cruz has strong experience in finance, budget management, and fiscal strategy. He was a strategic consultant, having worked at the Corporate Executive Board and the Advisory Board Company for more than a decade in successive leadership positions in the U.S. and internationally. And that must have been when you were a teenager, right? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Cruz has a B.A. in philosophy from Yale University. We are so honored to have Rick Cruz here with us today. And I'm going to introduce our esteemed moderator. Marvin Bowser just concluded a 34-year career in the defense industry. He just retired. Where he served 10 years in the United States Air Force, six years as a Navy civilian, and 18 years as a defense contractor. Career highlights including, include being an intelligence briefer for chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Colin Powell and leading the software and sensor integration segments for the Navy's largest autonomous surface vessel project, that's a hard one to say this morning, which is currently undergoing sea trials on the West Coast. Mr. Bowser is a former DC Arts Commission Vice Chair, former co-chair of Mayor Bowser's Arts and Creative Economy Transition Committee, former member of the Hillcrest Community Civic Association Board, and former mayor of the town of Eagle Harbor, Maryland. He currently serves as the vice chair of the H.D. Woodson STEM Advisory Board. Marvin launched Marv Image Photography this spring and is also pursuing a career in acting. Mr. Bowser is a native Washingtonian and holds an MA in telecommunications from the George Washington University and a BS in international business from American University. Please join me in welcoming our moderator, Marvin Bowser. Every time I hear that bio, I feel like I'm like 102 years old, but <laughs> I'm not really. I started when I was two. So, <laughs> so good morning and welcome everyone. And, and, and as Karen said, we're so happy to have this opportunity to, to share the views of these, these esteemed gentlemen with, with you and talk about this really important topic. So I'm not one to play around, so let's jump right in. Dr. Clark, um, you're the founder and CEO of a charter school. And you've placed an emphasis on hiring uh, men and men of color. Why is that? Well, good, good morning, everyone. Uh, I, uh, I'm so excited to, first of all, um, have a school where we are focusing on improving reading and, and writing literacy for our students. Um, one of the reasons that uh, I've placed a lot of energy around hiring males is because our community lacks that, and a lot of our students, quite frankly, uh, unfortunately, the students that we serve, uh, 
the, the male is absent in their home. And so it's quite important to know that our students uh, spend a majority of their time during the week, uh, 70, 80 hours sometimes with some of our kids, uh, that they need a male, a positive male role model. I mean, without a doubt, our uh, ladies have always carried the torch. And I think it's very important that we make sure that we have a balance for our kids and, and to show them uh, uh, that a world exists where males can lead and that uh, particularly for the young men that they have another role model that they can see a reflection of themselves. Thank you, Dr. Clark. I'm going to uh, Principal Little. Um, you were in the classroom and you decided to stay in education for a while. Can you talk to your motivation for staying with education? It started off, thank, first, thanks for having me. Um, it started off with a question from a student. Can you hang with me? Um, it was a fourth grade student my first year in Washington, D.C. Um, I was a case manager in special education and we had a challenging student and I tried all the best practices that I, ta I was learned, um, that taught in college. And out of frustration, I asked, what do I need to do to make you make your choices? And he looked at me and said, to hang with me. And I didn't understand what he, what he meant at the time. I said, what did you, you know, I asked him, what did you mean? And he said, can we hang out on the weekends? Can we go somewhere? And at that time, I remember the movie. It meant more to me than I think to him. <laughs> X-Men 2 United. And we went <laughs> to, the, um, to watch it. And I'm not lying. After that, we built that relationship between a teacher and a student. And we talked about good choices, wrong choices. This young man didn't have a father figure or a brother. Um, in his classroom. He never had a male teacher. I was his case manager for special education. And it just went back to remind me when I was in school. I never had the privilege of having a male um, African American teacher from first grade all the way through college. And I did not want that to happen to another student to where I wished I saw or had the opportunity to hang with my teachers like I saw some of my peers did. Um, like um, previous um, panel members stated, our African American women, they're doing a great job. Our other races are doing a great job. But who better understands what an African American boy is going through than an African American male teacher? Um, and that's very important. And from then, once I ended up at Eco Academy Public Charter School, the founder at the time, um, Cassandra Pinkley and Dr. Joe Smith, and our COO, um, Ms. Trini Stett Jones, helped me live out my mission and my vision to help all students um, and provide them the opportunity that they desperately need. Thank you. Rick Cruz, from your position as chair of the public charter schools, what's your philosophy about encouraging more uh, men of color to open schools? Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's hard to hear these two gentlemen and uh, to be in their schools and not believe that we should have more schools who not only have male representation in the classroom, but are being uh, led by, founded by um, men of color. And, uh, and for me, it's, it's, it's a real priority. Our, our priority as the public charter school board now for 20 years has been um, high quality uh, school options for students. Uh, and um, the challenge, to be blunt about it, has not been um, the founding of schools by leaders of color. It's been the ability of those schools to st stay open, to have the resources, um, financial, talent-wise, governance-wise, to, um, to uh, remain open and to succeed with uh, our students. Uh, I, I'm very proud of the number of schools that have stepped forward, the number of leaders of color um, that have stepped forward in the last three or four years, and, and we're going to see some more schools opening um, just this fall uh, that are being led by leaders of color. And it's not enough, um, but it's something that I think we c we're, we're going to see a lot more of. Uh, and I know I speak for um, our board 
uh, that we want to do everything to encourage them. Uh, and there, and we can have much longer, longer conversation about the resources that are needed to make sure that they're that they're successful. I, I do want to follow up on that. So, so what are you doing? What can be done to help the the, the schools being led by people of color succeed? Yeah. So, um, you know, there's there is um, first of all making um, the the process um, as transparent as possible, uh, and actually just getting out there and saying what I'm saying today, which is that um, we want a real portfolio of schools uh, in, in the city. We have we have great um, uh, CMOs, great networks of schools. We have great uh, independent schools. We have a number of smaller sort of one, two campus, three, four campus schools, uh, and uh, and just encouraging people to step forward, uh, tell us what you what you. Um, Want to build in your school? How you want to serve students? Uh, and we're and we're here to listen. Um, in our role as an authorizer, that's that's what we what we can do. What I think we also need to speak out for is uh, is the need for additional um, resources and thinking about how to support leaders of color. Uh, and uh, I'm, a, I'm a founding board member of an organization, a national organization called the National Charter Collaborative, which has spent a lot of time over the last two years understanding why schools led by leaders of color are not staying open or not succeeding. Uh, and there are just fundamental disconnects. Uh, first of all, this, uh, we spent uh, two years just trying to understand across the country um, which schools are actually led by leaders of color. There's the, the information sometimes just isn't available. Uh, so, and that's a starting point. Spending time in community and understanding that you know, the lack of oftentimes social capital, access to capital, the, the uh, real financial capital, um, the, uh, the challenges around um, building a governance structure that is of the community that's going to help you lead that and, and build and reinforce those connections. Um, we, we really, we need to think about it and, and, and uh, focus on it uh, um, in DC, but we also need to have this conversation nationally. Uh, and it's, you know, I can only speak for the charter school experience because that's, that's the world that I'm, that I'm in, but we all know that oftentimes that's lacking in terms of the leadership in our larger uh, education sector. So I'm so thankful for this conversation because it has tentacles into so many aspects of what we need to do, as a, certainly as a community, but also as a country. Great. Thanks, Rick. So Cameron, um, you're in the forefront of this issue because you're recruiting uh, men of color uh, for the classroom. What are your day-to-day -day challenges in, in doing that? Um, good morning, first of all, and thank you to the organizers for having me. And um, such a pleasure to be amongst such a distinct, dis distinguished panel. Um, in terms of challenges recruiting men of color, um, I first want to look at it kind of from a more global perspective. I mean, quite frankly, every industry across the world, right, is competing for the best talent. And that's regardless of whether we're in the education space or otherwise. So for myself, I do quite a bit of recruiting um, on the, across the university landscape. And so um, I'm recruiting, of course, alongside other high quality programs. I recruit for Urban Teachers, a national nonprofit that is um, amazing, doing some amazing work. But I'm not only recruiting alongside other alternative certification programs, other um, institutions of higher learning. I'm also um, recruiting alongside Fortune 100 companies, right, who also want strong candidates um, to fill their pipelines. Um, and then secondly, um, we can look at kind of the funnel of qualified candidates, right? So um, we're talking about um, men of color, but then more specifically men of color who have college degrees. Then we're talking about men of color who have college degrees who want to go into education, right? And then at that point, we're talking about a mutual, mutual fit. We want them, but the question is, do, we, do they want us? And do they want to teach in a very genuine way? I think a lot of us um, have kind of illusions of grandeur. Yes, I'm passionate about education, I'm passionate about teaching, but we're only passionate in theory. And so we have to determine as a recruiter, it's my job to determine, you know, how much of what you're telling me or what you're presenting to me is going to be enough to sustain you when the rubber hits the road. Um, so we're talking about a small candidate of pool, a small pool of candidates um, who are going to go into education um, and then to, I think, Mr. Little's point about developing this relationship with the student outside of the classroom, we have to look at how we market 
um, teaching to men of color. Because as much as it's a motivating factor to tell a 22-year-old, 23-year-old, um, here's an opportunity to impact and change a community, that's also very frightening. Because my success or failure as a teacher is not just a reflection upon me personally and professionally. I am letting down an entire community. And so I think a lot of these, uh, a lot of my more recent graduates and career changers, they're keenly aware of the moral imperative that comes with teaching. And like I said, in as much as it motivates people, it's also, um, it gives them pause and hesitation. So we have to think about um, what are we asking? Uh, when we ask a man of color to come in the classroom that we're not asking of women and that we're not asking of white men who go in a profession. We're adding additional responsibilities that's built into that role. Um, and there's no conversation that comes along with that. So I'll stop there. <laughs> OK. So, so you said that you were focusing pe uh, people who wanted to be teachers. What about people who don't know that they want to be teachers? And people who um, are, are available for a second career. So they, 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 they've been like myself. Like I've, I've, I've done uh, my, my defense work. And I'm doing other work now because I still have some rubber left on my tread, right? <laughs> so there, there, there are other people like that out there. Yeah, so is that directed to me? Yeah. So for folks who don't know that they want to be a teacher, um, I mean, we kind of run a risk there, right? Because if the answer is, no, I don't want this, then as school districts, as CMOs, as recruiters, we've now invested a lot of time and financial capital. Yeah, but I'm talking about somebody recruiting. who's now more mature, okay? Oh. Not, not the 22-year-old who's, who's still well, a little I think that's the truth. These are people who are established. Well, I think, but I've, I've seen instances of career changes in their 40s and 50s who've gotten into the classroom, right, with the understanding of what schooling meant for them when they were students. Mm -hmm. And now they're experiencing something that's entirely different. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not too far removed from the students that I teach, um, but even when I was 25, 27, teaching third graders, I was in some instances considerably older than the parents of my students, right? So, and that was a total paradigm shift for me whose first grade teacher was also a teacher when my mother was in school. And so, again, I, to the career changer, that is a risk because they don't know. If they say yes, what are ways, I think your question is, what are ways we can attract more people um, who are career changers? Look at it, create a bigger pool. Yeah, I mean, I think all of us want um, career changers or people with professional experience because they bring so much, um, so many skills, right, that are beneficial to the classroom. But again, I go back to the... But is to your point, they still have to learn that, that classroom experience. Got, got, it, got it. Who else has had success cha and challenges um, attracting talent, men of color? I think it's a challenge. <clears throat> I think it's a challenge um, getting men of color and especially the career changers. I got, so so but let, let me, I let me re mm -hmm. rephrase the question. Mm -hmm. I, I think we all get that it's a challenge. How, how can we succeed with it? How and can we do better? I think how what has worked? First of all, I do want to say that I think that we need, as educators, um, I was heavily influenced by my academic advisor once I went to Virginia State University when I saw this man who looked like me express the interest and the value of teaching that it was inspired me so we can't wait for the career changers we need to go to the colleges when our students are going for orientation and tell them that yes there's a career in education I, we always hear you're an educator that's a humbling job Educators have the humbling jobs. No, we have a career, and we have an opportunity. We have to have dedication to improve students' lives. Um, they can't wait for, if they're in first grade, they can't wait till they go to third grade to learn how to read. They, they need a person who's going to model for them, especially our young boys who they see African-American males make it successful in entertainment and sports they do not have that opportunity like their other counterparts to see an educator in the classroom who looks like them, who shows them that it is cool to read with expression. It is cool 
to solve a problem in math. Do not be scared to learn. And once we fix, in my opinion, our amount of educators who are African American males in the early ages of college, then we do not have to wait heavily on career changes. Okay. Okay. Dr. Clark? I, I appreciate these two gentlemen for loosening up the conversation and let's take the gloves off. <laughs> and so we can really kind of talk about really what's happening. Um, I'm one of those leaders. I, I, I don't have a challenge finding males, but there is clearly a challenge finding male leaders, African-American men of color to go into the classroom. One of the things I think is so important that as a leader, we recognize this. So that's the problem one. Two, we go out, we have to go to those colleges and start to provide mentorship. So one of the reasons I don't have issues is because I'm on those college campuses and I'm starting to become a mentor for several individuals who are thinking about education and thinking about educating youth. The other thing is, is that I'm quite honest about what education really is. I'm not going to feed you a myth around that you go, go in, there's an 8 to 5 or 8 to 3, and you can go home and there's no work to take home with you. I'm very honest about the type of parents that we serve. I'm very honest about the kids that we serve and the deficits that we're going to have to work through. And if you really want this job, then we need you in there, but we don't need you if you're not going to do the work. And so... I think uh, also leaders are afraid. Uh, we got to step back a moment and not be afraid to take a risk. Uh, you know, people get titles and they're excited about their title, so they're afraid to really push themselves and step out to do what it takes to get things done. And so, um, those individual males that come to work for my organization, they have to work or they can't remain there. And I think that is the positive part of what we have to do as educators to lead these and groom these young men that are coming in. I can take the instance of a young man that I have working in my program now. This is his uh, third year teaching. The first year he was a disaster. But he had the will and he had the, the fight and he every day he stayed with the program. Can you help me? Can you show me? Can I learn? And so I had to be the leader that would say, let's talk about the positive things you're doing and let's begin to see how we can continue to develop. Professional development is so important for our, our leaders. And, and I think we want to take away the stereotype that if you put black men in classes with black children, you have success. That's not true. If you put black men who are not qualified in classrooms with kids who are uneducated, you're going to have a disaster. It has to be a great marriage that goes together with them. And black men are not there to just do discipline. And I think that's the stereotype that if you put us in a classroom, then the schools will get better. And we start to look at just, hey, they do great things over there. There are no kids are getting in trouble. That doesn't mean anything. It has to have someone that's in the classroom that's serious about the learning. Part of the reason that I went and, and, and did my doctorate work in higher education is because I needed to be able to know what the other side looked like that my kids were going to. It didn't make sense for me to know about other things. I needed to bridge that gap. And if on the high school level we're saying we want them to go to college, I need to know what college is expecting. And so we can train them and I can train those people in the classroom to prepare our kids to do what's right and to do what's necessary and to learn what's necessary. But we're not men of color that's just going to control kids. That's not what education is about. And I think that's a misnomer that's out there. Put the black guy in the class and everything will be fine. I've seen some weak black men that can't control children. And I've seen some strong uh, 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 women of other nationalities that can control classrooms better than that big black guy. So it's time to, to make sure that we're looking at things from the perspective that the real world is looking for. And leaders can't be afraid to take risks just because we have a title. Thank you. Uh, Cam Cameron, you have a comment? Yeah, I'm so happy that you asked the question about what are solutions to this situation? And I think, um, now this is a, a, a very lofty um, comment, but we have to think about the ways in which black and brown students experience K-12 education. If we're talking about attracting them to become a part of this teaching core, what has been their experience when they were on the other side of the desk? You know, and we have to really start 
not only having conversations about race, racism, and implicit bias, but we all have to check ourselves um, and really retrain the way we think and, and then retrain the behaviors that follow. Because to his point, we have all we all experienced this system of racism and bias right so if you put a black male at the helm of a classroom who then perpetuates racist practices in that same classroom what are the outcomes really going to be and so that's something that's super adaptive right it's not a quick fix but i do want to give you guys some technical things that we can do number one increase financial resources and financial incentives we know that the starting salaries for teachers in your large urban system urban districts aren't too bad but when we compare those to other industries we're still falling behind and so our top graduates again have a hard time making that choice from a monetary perspective and then at a school and district level speaking to principals speaking to um, superintendents and cluster leaders and all of that think about ways that we can build spaces of affinity for black men in education and it doesn't have to be in your school. That would be great, right? If we could retain teachers mm -hmm. so that the two that we have this year are in addition to the three that we um, recruit next year. And so now we have a cohort of five in the building. Mm -hmm. But additionally, there are professional networks for men of color in education. And so connecting the individuals with those networks, and I'm speaking specifically of Profound Gentlemen that is headquartered out of Charlotte, the Fellowship Black Male Educators for Social Justice that's head, um, headquartered out of Philadelphia. Those are ways that black men or men of color, they find spaces that meet the needs um, along the gender lines and racial lines that they need. Um, and then, uh, and of course, I have to think, um, throw this out there again, that recruitment and retention cannot be discussed um, in a mutually exclusive way. They go hand to hand. Because as soon as we can recruit candidates, we're also losing them on the back end. So we have to figure out how we fix the hole in the bucket. Can, can I say one other thing? Um, I, I just, I want to thank Mr. Cruz for his leadership and one of the things that he brought up was the fact of resources. I, as a, as a, uh, a, a leader of color, one of the things that really frustrates me a lot is the fact that you have these organizations that really deal with uh, school funding and you take a, their, their bars are so high. When I say the bar is so high, meaning that, you know, they're expecting these you get kids that are three to five grade levels behind when you get them. And, you know, you do some absolutely uh -huh. wonderful things and you start to see growth. But your growth is not overnight. So when you take two weeks, three weeks to fill out this grant application, you're turned down because you don't meet the minimum number. That doesn't mean that you haven't really done amazing work. And so what happens is the funding that's there that you need to continue or a, a greatly improve the work never comes to you. And so the schools that are always on top, they always get the funding, which doesn't make sense to me because the kids that need the most funding are the ones that are always rejected, even though your product is fantastic. And the fact that you've made so many great strides in doing that, but people will say, well, I'm sorry, you're... you're um, your, uh, um, your, your program has not reached the level that we wanted to reach. But have you looked at the fact that the kid was third grade when they got here and they're seventh grade reading now? Is, that, is, is there, I'm sorry, is there an opportunity to talk to the, the grant programs to, to have a different, uh, a different grant process or, or program to, to address what you're talking about? Well, so you have those conversations, but you know you only get the person that answers the phone. <laughs> you never get the, the real person to really sit down and, and say, listen, you guys have a real misunderstanding of how you're granting these dollars. And so if we're really, and everybody's really being honest that they really want to fix education, then stop playing games and really say, listen, here's, the, here's the, where the funding really needs to go, all right? And it needs to go to the most high-risk kids. How do you have the most high-risk schools that you have in a particular place, and you give them the least amount of funding, you give them the, 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 the worst buildings to, to operate in uh, with, without having the, the, the proper stuff to expand kids' uh, uh, mindset. I'm a kid that had a poor public school education growing up. 
I did great in college, but I graduated from high school with a 1.6 grade average. I scored 480 on an SAT. But I went on to get two bachelor's degrees, three master's degrees, and a doctorate degree. <laughs> Something happened in between that. And so what happened in the gap in public school and the school that I went to, it's a parking lot now. It, you know, it, it was knocked down, it's rightfully so, but it finally took somebody with a, a, a ounce of brains to say, listen, we need to do something positive for these particular kids, but the money's not there. And we really got to talk about what these folks are looking at as they grant these dollars towards the kids that really need it the most. Okay, thank you. Can, can yeah. I jump, jump in on that? You, uh, Dr. Clark, there's so much packed into there. I'll just pick a couple of things. That, you know, you know, I think philanthropy um, is getting the message, but it's slow. Uh, and we need to make sure that we're not just piling more initiatives. Uh, there are a lot of initiatives out, out there. Like, how do we put a couple million dollars against getting more people of color, black men, into programs? No one's going to say no to that because the problem is so this problem is so big because we're talking about seven percent. But what? these gentlemen are all talking about are systemic issues. Like how do we actually make sure that when um, schools need funding uh, to you know, invest in facilities, to pour more money into serving the students who need it, uh, they don't have to create some side sort of project. Like there, every, there's lots of side hustles. There's like, we're going to create a STEM program because that'll get me money to serve these students, when actually what we need are social workers and mental health. You know, we, we need like core stuff. And, and in D.C., where we, we've got a lot of funding coming, coming um, from, from the city, which is great, uh, but it just never feels like enough because our kids come with a lot of trauma. And we're not going to, you know, stem them, robotics them. Like, they need some core supports. And that's the conversation we need to be having um, uh, with, with our legislature, uh, with, but also with, with philanthropy. We need just more money to support support students in really fundamental ways, and I think that's what that's what will create environments where our black men will want to stay in the classroom because they see the school, their their community um, being respective, and and budgets budgets matter, uh, budgets matter a whole lot. Right. Thank you. So, Karen, Karen, time check. Okay. Um, Dr. Clark, I wanted to pick up on your belief that illiteracy is a civil rights issue of today and ca catastrophe for tomorrow. Can you talk about that? I'm, I'm with the premise, I believe in the premise that if kids can't read, they have no options. And if we, if a kid shows up to kindergarten and they don't know their ABCs or their one, two, threes, they're already doomed. Our, our public schools are, no matter what anyone says, they're not totally designed to fix a kid that's already behind when they walk in the door. We have to do better with raising parents and making sure that parents are held accountable for ensuring that our kids are where they need to be when they arrive to school. Um, I believe that illiteracy takes, if, if we can take away that, kids that know how to read, they have options. Kids that, that know how to read, they're not out on the corners because they're in college. Kids that know how to read are in, a, in, in the armed forces. They're doing something positive because they are able to, to, to move forward. The literacy piece for me uh, and why I'm really so hard on it is I, I look through a window of myself and just realize some of the deficiencies that I had before I reached college. And so I don't want, ever want a child to experience the challenges that I had. Uh, and so part of that, and, 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 and we have this other misnomer that a kid that has, sometimes a kid that has two parents comes from a stable home, we think that they are not, that, that, that they cannot have challenge problems with academics, and that's not true. Because I was a kid with a stable home, great parents, and I still had challenges with academics. And so for me, the literacy piece, we have to push. That is a big concept for me and making sure that our kids can read. One of the reasons that our, our school is focused on journalism and media arts is because it came from the premise that if I could get kids to, if I can improve their reading, then their writing skills will get better. If we improve their writing skills, their reading and writing skills, then they will develop a voice. And they can go back and improve the lives of one person at a time in their community. And so illiteracy, to me, if we don't fix that, then nothing else will ever 
be successful, but we got to raise those parents because that is the big deal. So, so I agree with your point that um, just have that um, having two parents uh, is, is is insufficient to guarantee success. So, but so, but having two parents, one parent, you know, grandparents even, um, how how do you get them involved in the education of the child and and get them away from the idea that the, the school is solely responsible for the education of the child? Well, the leader of the school has to really, uh, the leader and leaders of the school have to really have a solid communication. I mean, that means uh, we do these empowerment forums at, at, at our school where we're bringing them in to empower them about things that parents need. So, for example, we're teaching them about finance. I'll bring a finance officer in. Things that they need to support them. The school has to be well-rounded. It's not just a place where you just educate children, but you educate the whole community. And so we that's part of how we're getting these, these parents involved. And as you do that, then you start saying, well, let's talk about the reading levels. And, and this is how we uh, get to this particular point. Do you know what the state assessment is called and what kinds of things are on that assessment? You bring the parents in by educating them on things that they need to make their lives better and in turn as they make their lives better then they're going to make their lives work great for their children thank, thank you would anyone else like to comment on involving the parents in the community in the education of the child I, was saying, I think um, you know we're talking I, in my mind that's that's the holy grail like how do we how do we you know get the get the parents um, get the parents engaged and, and I think that's one of you know one of the themes that's come across this morning is around you know being very you know, authentic in the classroom so how you know if you're getting um, men of color in the classroom who um, have an understanding who have a nuanced identity about being in that classroom and and, and serving the community uh, and I think that um, relationship building that you described with with the student um, also happens with with our parents when it's when it's working best uh, it's just it's a it's a man hour literally a man hours issue like re, you know being able to be present after school hours and and, and you know to your to your point about the empowerment summits like how do we create more opportunities for that family engagement means more than just calling a parent when your child had a bad day and that's what the think the bulk of communication goes to our parents it's not hey Johnny scored Johnny improved in his reading um, in his Fontes Purnell by from letter B to G that's a celebration we don't talk about that celebrations mm -hmm. I believe that men of color when it comes to behavior they understand the struggles that our students are going through our boys are going through so they understand that before you can redirect that behavior that you're going to have to diffuse the, the student from whatever is bothering him you have to look you know you know our students are proud especially our boys when so when you notice a boy that comes to school mm -hmm. and is angry it's up to you to redirect him to get him available to learn again you have to ask those questions we, we know what happened did you eat we noticed that you're not going on a field trip. I didn't go on field trips. I knew that my parents at a certain time knew that they couldn't pay for the field trip, so I stopped bringing the slips home. And the school had no problem with me staying at school. So when we noticed that a student staying home, it's up to those teachers, male teachers, understand that, look, we're going to pay for this student to go on the field trip because we understand that he doesn't have the money. We understand. I came from a school system my first year where everyone wore a white T-shirt. You wore a white t-shirt because it was the cheapest thing to get from the family dollar. And so I had a student that, and I asked him, do you wet your bed? Because I, you know, I can smell. And he says that he sleeps with three other brothers in the same bed. So what, what happened on Fridays? He gave me all his white t-shirts and I went and I washed those white t-shirts for him. I had food for him. I had an envelope with a comb and deodorant because you know, as kids, they're gonna wanna feel and look good before they can learn. You have to take that, mm -hmm. that roadblock from them in the beginning of the, of the day to encourage them to have a good opportunity. But once again, back to your point, that parents want to hear positive things about their child because they're tired of the negative. If they're hearing the negative at school, you know they hear it at home as well, and it's up to us to stop that practice. Thank, thank you. 
So we're, uh, thank, thank you panelists. <laughs> so now we have 10 minutes for Q&A. Sir. Good morning, thank you for a great panel. My name is Omekongo, I'm a professor So I know we've talked a lot about, um, well, I've thrown out financial incentives, and I know specifically with recruiting folks to Washington, D.C., is that your question? Yes. To teach in D.C.? Housing. In addition to teaching, but just in terms of more resources as well, in terms yeah. of support that you mentioned the schools. Need. Housing. Housing options, viable housing options for candidates who are coming from, well, whether they're from outside of the district or the, the uh, metropolitan area or whether they live here. Um, I think starting salaries for district and charter schools are about $50,000. Um, and so folks are going to be, after taxes, they're going to be taking home about $35,000, $3,200. You know, and so if we think about a, a budget, right, you don't want your housing to be more than a third of that. Where can a person with a college degree live in relative proximity to the district for $1,000 per month for rent. And so I know other, and I mention that because there are other cities around the country. San Francisco is the one that comes to mind most saliently. Um, but they have partnered with other um, organizations to provide housing for um, folks who work in education and work in the classrooms. And that is, as a person on the front line, that is a huge problem for me. I know that the salary, readjusting salary schedules is a very different conversation, but we can look outside of salary, right, to say, how can a person afford to live in one of the most expensive cities in the world and teach and thrive and get up every day and take kids to the movies on the weekend and be a father and an uncle and a goddad? So, like, I think housing is one um, critical piece of that puzzle. So good luck to you in your run, and please get us some housing out here. <laughs> Other comments? Yep. Um, I, you know, I think things that uh, I can only speak to the things that I've seen work in, in the charter sector is that um, where where we can preserve the independence and the autonomy in the schools, so that they're if you know if you if you want a black or brown man in front of the classroom, uh, you want to be able to tell them that they can figure out what the problems are, which you guys have pointed out, and then have the resources and the flexibility to run their classroom. Um, like, like they need to in order to achieve the goals that we, we, we put out in front of them. Um, so how do we make sure that they not just have the funding, but that they've got um, the autonomy uh, to run that classroom as they should, obviously in, in cooperation with the, the, their leadership, uh, and also the, the facilities. Um, when, when you can have a, a great facility where students, can, uh, students and teachers uh, can be proud of that uh, build, uh, building and can do the projects and the work and break into groups and address all the challenges, those are really, really important components. There are great um, schools that have grown out of um, what we would say are suboptimal facilities, and they've done great things for lots of, lots of kids in the city, um, but that we're at kind of a breaking point on that. Uh, and we do need, we need great facilities, we need uh, you know, the, the independence and the autonomy. That's what makes this uh, you know, a value proposition. We're not gonna be able to raise salaries to 150K for teachers anytime soon, although like, I would love to see us try to, try to do that. Uh, but uh, but how, what can we do to make it a great place for them to work and, and, and live into that moral imperative that, that's mentioned earlier of like building up, building up their community? Thank you. Question, yes ma'am. <laughs> because my mother instilled, you know, you go to college and you get a good degree to get a job. So how, what are the so, incentives that we can take give for people actually on campus to say change your major, consider going education? So your question is, how do we encourage students to major in education? Yeah. yeah. I, okay. I, I think the first thing is that I, one of the most important things is to try to get the chair of the education department to reach out to male leaders of color. 
uh, in the district and invite us over to have a conversation. And then I believe that, that we will step up to uh, begin to mentor and provide some leadership to kind of push those kids along, to young people along, I'm sorry, young people along to uh, talk about the, the benefits of education. They need a real world application and we would be that model for them to see exactly what it looks like and, and they can see the reflection of where they could be. You know, I believe that we should provide you know, internships for, um, for these college students. Like I said before, we cannot wait until the job fairs and career days for, to recruit. It has to start early when our, when our babies from leaving 12th grade going to their freshman year mm -hmm. to see an educational booth and have to talk and talk about the benefits and, and bring down all the myths. Do teachers get paid a lower salary? For Yes, but for 10 months, there's other opportunities that you can do, summer school, after school programs. So there's ways to even out your pay playing field. Um, so like I said, there's numerous ways that we can do that, but we have to educate our college students early and not later. Yeah, so um, I'm a graduate of Howard. I recruit very heavily from Howard University. Um, I also have two, um, two interns on campus there. Howard is a very specific and a special instance because, um, as we know, it is a historically black college, but it's one of the most heavily recruited campuses on the world. Um, Howard gets recruited as heavily almost as the Ivy Leagues. And so it is very difficult to, um, to encourage students to pursue um, degrees in education, but it's not impossible. There are a lot of um, partnerships that Howard University has with nonprofits, such as Jumpstart and DC Reads. And we, okay, so, and, and we call those pre-service teaching um, experiences. And so getting students while they're in college into those experiences is a really great way to get them um, excited about education. However, um, I know that even with Jumpstart, it's, they're, they're experiencing some challenges with um, breaking through the noise on campus, right? I'm sure you um, are, are well aware of the amount of notifications and events and panels and discussions that are always happening on campus. So it's about really getting to the right group of students. Um, but those pre-services opportunities are awesome. Jumpstart comes to mind, the Breakthrough Collaborative City Year, and a number of other um, routes to get folks excited about teaching. Good, thank you. Question, sir. Hi, um my name is Dr. Oye Oluwa. I'm a pharmacist. And um, before I get into my question, I kind of want to give you um, a little bit of... So we're a we're bit. almost okay, at the end of our time, okay, so, okay, so get there. So I feel like when it comes to questions about education, a lot of the questions are directed at educators and parents and students. Not a lot is focused on the community. Um, so my way of giving back, I'm part of a nonprofit called Reset. And what we do is we bring science to elementary schools, elementary school students to let them not only get interested in STEM, but also see people that look like them that are also pharmacists and doctors and whatnot. My question is, do you think there's a value in that in, um, in, in charter schools and as well, what is the process to get these volunteer programs into charter schools? Or so aid? is there a, va a value in bringing volunteer programs that expose students to the, pro to the profession STEM? Correct. And, and more, uh, yeah. Make yourself available, like, you know, after this, you know, we can talk um, about this opportunity mm -hmm. because, as you see, STEM, you know, at Eagle Academy, we do, you know, we add the A and have STEAM because we had the arts in it, but we're always looking for ways to encourage our students to want to do something, you know, learning <coughs> is across all, all the curriculums, right. and through the sciences is a wonderful way. So if you're looking, you're in Ward 8, Eagle Academy's in Ward 8, we can talk after this, but that's, you know, that's the making these companies make themselves available is one of the first steps. All right, thank you. Yes, ma'am, last question. Good morning. Um, my name is Ona Island Day, and I'm the outreach coordinator at Eagle Academy Public Charter School and the founder of Healing Broken Wings Incorporated. But I come to you as a mother today. What initiatives are really being driven for young black males who suffer from PTSD? I have a son who is 11 years old who's been diagnosed with PTSD, and I have to take him from his school to Children's Hospital, making him miss half of his day of school every week for services that need to be provided. But he's frustrated because there's nobody that looks like him that's trying to help him. So what's really being done to help children right now? So what programs are available to help children with PTSD yes, and young African American males? Panel. So uh, 
one of the things I would say, uh, not just PTSD, but students with ADHD and, and other challenges, one of the things we typically do is that I have martial arts at my program. Uh, and so in the afternoon, I have members of the uh, uh, Nation of, uh, of Islam that, that actually are, are teaching Jakarta, and we're working with some of the most challenged young men on how to redirect their uh, anger or redirect their uh, um, aggression, aggression at, at certain times. And so that's one of the programs that we typically use to work, uh, and I, I, that's just one that's been working well for us at, at our school. Other comments? Last round, are we, are we out of time? I, I have one more question I, I wanted to ask. Okay, moderator's pri privilege. <laughs> how do girls, how do our girls learn differently, or do they learn differently when, when there's a man teaching? <laughs> That's a whole nother uh, <laughs> session. <laughs> like, you, you, you got <laughs> but we all do know that when it comes to absentee um, parents, I'm talking about our fathers, um, incarceration, um, mm -hmm. death. I mean, I've never seen so many students that lose their parents, mm -hmm. boys and girls at their early ages. So it impacts them. So having a man of color in the classroom not only helps our African American boys, they help our African American girls as well. Um, other races, they're going to learn, like, they're black professionals, they're black supervisors that are males. So they have to learn now to be able to look at a black young man and see, once again, not a sports figure, right. not an entertainer, exactly. but a hard worker. If it's an educator, it's an educator. If it's an engineer, it's an engineer, because we have the ability to be successful in all fields. I think also it's important that black males have exchanged, uh, piggyback, on what he said that the black male has exchanged the role from the absentee father and now we've assumed that role in the school while the father is absent or the father is just coming home because there's a lot of gentlemen just coming home and and so we're having to help that father figure out how to re-engage himself and so it's so important that we filled in the gap and now we're having to slowly help him transition the relationship. And that's so important for these young ladies because fathers really mean a lot to our young ladies in guiding them. And so we have to be that bridge builder for those young ladies. Thank you. So panel, um, thank you for your service to our city and our children, your leadership and your, what your, I, I can feel how much you care about what you're doing. So, so thank you, and please keep it up. And we should do everything we can to make them successful as they, as successful as they can be in doing that. So thank you. Before I know you all have questions for our panelists, but we definitely want to get a photo of all of you together. Marvin, please come up. So if you gentlemen can uh, stand together, we can get a photo. And I'm hoping, as Tamika and I were sitting here, we were thinking this can't stop. This conversation needs to continue and, and go deeper. So thank you so much, gentlemen, for your time today.